Hello everyone, welcome to another one of our Through the Bible Studies in Shady Oak Ministries. Today we're going to be overviewing the book of James. Yes, I said overviewing, not going through, because unfortunately, while this book isn't as long as it may seem, it is meaty. And if I were to go through it verse by verse, we'd be here for hours. So what I want to do is instead of going through the entire book, which I encourage all of you to do on your own time, give the Holy Spirit something to speak about. My goal here in this study and in this video is to equip you for that endeavor, to give you the necessary background information and overview the main themes and points that are made in this book so that you can examine them in further detail on your own. So if you'd like to join me in that, first let's start obviously with the book itself. Who wrote the book of James? Kind of self-explanatory, but understand that the original copies of these books, these letters for the most part in the New Testament, weren't cited and titled in the way that we are. The way that they would title these books was either to the audience they were addressing, see Romans, 1 Corinthians, Philemon, etc., or it was by the author themselves, see James, as well as 1 John, 1 Peter, so on and so forth. Now, when we're talking about the book of James, it was written by James, but that's a very popular name. What is uh, the James we are actually, who rather, is the James we're referring to? Well, if I were to narrow it down for you, his name in his modern day would have been James Ben Yosef. Now, that probably helps you even less, but let me clarify this in a way that may get your attention. He was Jesus' younger brother. I'm sure you have questions. I thought Mary was a virgin. How could she have had kids if when she, oh, when she gave birth to Jesus, as Matthew and Luke both specify, she had not, in fact, had sexual intercourse before. But after Jesus was born, the texts are very clear. Joseph did not know her, in that sense, until, not ever, but until her son was born. Now, understand this. Jesus, yes, was divinely conceived and born from someone who had not gone through the processes of normal child conception in order to fulfill the prophecies that were stacking the deck in God's favor so we'd recognize him when he showed up. But after Jesus was born, Mary and Joseph had a normal Jewish family, anywhere between five or seven kids. And I say that not as a generalization, as is oftentimes the stereotype in the Middle East, but in fact, was the case. We are given the names of three of Jesus' biological half-brothers, Mary and Joseph's biological offspring, which were James, Judas, and John. But also understand as well, not, not Judas Iscariot, by the way, Judah, Judas is a conjunction of both. It's a very common name during that time as well. But it also mentions sisters. So if we're going to say at the least possible, sisters plural would be at least two, we have three brothers and at least two sisters. So that's five kids. Mary wasn't always a virgin. But when we're talking about this topic, understand that James was the oldest offspring of Mary and Joseph biologically and the little brother of Jesus of Nazareth. Now, if we're going to talk about somebody who would have some interesting insights as to what it was like to not only hear Jesus speak, but for crying out loud, growing up with him, it would be James. But understand as well, not only was Jesus biologically connected, or was James uh, biologically connected to Jesus in that regard, not only was he relationally, but also in authority. He was the leader of the early church, and for obvious reason. Being the one who was in charge of the church in Jerusalem, where the church was founded, essentially, he even had a higher regard among the early church fathers than Peter or John. So when we're talking about this guy, we're talking about someone who would have a lot of interesting things to tell us. And unfortunately, he only wrote one letter before his martyrdom. But when we're talking about these things, it's important to understand the type of person we're hearing from. It gives us that much more reason to listen to what he has to say. Now, what is he saying? Is he talking about history? Is he expressing his perspective as inspired by the Holy Spirit? Or is he speaking in regards to prophecy, giving God's perspective, and is just essentially the middleman in communicating that information? Well, as you recall, we've gone through every single one of these books emphasizing those three points. Which 
book are we reading? What kind of book are we reading? Which book is James? But what book are we reading? Is it history focusing on what happened? Is it doctrine focusing on what people did while it was happening? Or prophecy focusing on what God thought about what was happening? Well, we would fall into the second category. Romans all the way through Jude would be doctrine, focusing on the individuals who had seen the history firsthand, the Gospels and the book of Acts. And then, based on their firsthand testimony, we listen to what they have to say, not just because they were interesting individuals and had the chance to see it firsthand, but because it wasn't, in fact, them recording this information. They were divinely inspired by the Holy Spirit who was speaking through them, not according to me, according to their own words, which have been proven not just concept-wise trustworthy, but personally trustworthy in lining up with every single prophet, someone who was a spokesman for God, who came before them, going all the way back to Moses. But more on that in a second. When was James written? Well, the accounts that we have on it are pretty consistent to say that it should have been before his death. I don't think that's unreasonable to assume. But it's also important to note that James, among the apostles, the big names in early Christianity, his martyrdom was actually pretty early on. It would date a little bit before 45 AD, so 12 to 15 years after Jesus' ascension to heaven. And it wasn't an easy death either. They threw him off the temple face, survived the fall. He continued preaching, so they tried to stone him by you know, pelting large rocks from a higher vantage point, still survived the process. Someone finally, in order to shut him up, ran at him with a club and bashed his skull in. And that's how James ended up dying. But after going through all of that, I would think that it would be very hard for him to write one last letter with his brains on the floor. So, call me old-fashioned. It had to have been before his death, which was very early on. Therefore, this book was written very early on. And these records that we have from the early church fathers, the people who were alive during this time, give numerous references to this book as well. Now... Where it was this book written, what audience is it intended to reach? Well, obviously the church as a whole, but more specifically the church that James was called to witness to, the church in Jerusalem. Now, this doesn't require too much foreknowledge of what the culture was like because his statements are pretty much just addressing human nature, which is true wherever you are in the world. But even more so and more importantly, understand that this is where James was at. So at least having some idea of the location and background may be helpful. The book is about how to live the Christian life. And you have to admire this term that is very characteristic of a guy like James. He was a guy we describe as a man of candor. Uh, not, not just in the fact that he was honest, but he would be honest even when you wish he wouldn't be. Someone who's honest almost to the point of being a fault. And James, no doubt you're going to see, definitely had that tendency to say it as it is, even if you wish he would say less of what was on his mind. Given that God was also pointing it on his mind, we appreciate that. But James had other nicknames too, not just being a man of candor, but they had a nickname for him back in the ancient days known as Old Camel Knees. If you ever encountered the animals, you know they have very calloused knees because when they sit down, they don't usually let their body touch. They just kind of tuck their arms and legs in. They first settle on their knees, then they just kind of let their forelegs rest and so forth. But when we're talking about James, why would they call him camel knees? Well, because they described his calluses on his knees as a result of him at any given state, him going to his knees and praying about it. So understand as well, this guy wasn't just mean or, you know, pushy or blunt. He was the kind of guy who regularly involved himself in pursuing God and was just as much acknowledging himself as needing this book applied to his own life more. But was also willing to share it because we also need to apply this book to our lives more. I'm not saying that just because it's what a pastor should say. I'm saying it because this is true and oh let it be true that this book would become more a part of my own life as well as for yours. But before what we hear what he had to say, why should we listen to what is said? Well, as I pointed out earlier, not just biologically, he had a direct tie to Jesus. Not just relationally, he grew up with the guy. He would know a little bit about what the guy's personality was like. And after discovering that he was, in fact, God himself, 
We'll talk about that more in a second. It gives us reason to hear it, but also understand as well, if anyone of any reputation gives you anything and you don't check it out, including this statement here, you're foolish. Because someone can sound like they're telling the truth and just as easily be lying as genuinely telling the truth. You can't judge someone's content based on their reputation. Someone who is known for telling the truth can still lie. Someone who's known for getting the facts right can still be wrong. Someone who has a dishonest reputation can still communicate truth. There may not be such a thing as an honest politician, but it doesn't mean that everything a politician says is false. That's the point. We judge the content, not the individual. That's why I make strong emphasis on the fact that I'm not this, you know, intense, in-depth, you know, $100 apologist scholar or anything like that. I got kicked out of college for sharing my faith in class. And when we're talking about these things, I wouldn't have as much to brag about as far as reputation goes than most people who would be in these internet apologetic circles. And I'm grateful for that because it means that you can't just look at me and say, oh, well, he obviously knows what he's talking about. I'm a brony. (laughs) You know, I'm just a guy on the internet telling you information. The question isn't, why should I trust him? It's why should I trust that? Test the information, not the one speaking. How do we test what James said? Well, because he was held to the same standard that anyone else would be if they dared to speak in the name of God. Now, notice I mentioned that. James isn't sharing his opinion or his worldview. Notice that was a part of it. But God used that to communicate something that was on his heart and mind. Now, when we understand this, how do we confirm that? When when I say the words, God is speaking, not me, no lightning. I said those words, but how do you know that they're true? Well, you test it. And what better way to test something than to go all the way back to someone who very plainly and obviously in a moment of history was used by God word for word to communicate his words to his people. And of course, I'm referring to Moses. James was held to the standard that Moses laid out in Deuteronomy 18, 18 through 22. And when we're talking about someone who's going to be a spokesman for God, they had to pass, and there are more, and they're basically saying the same basic points, but I've narrowed them down to four for the simplicity of the listeners here. Firstly, they have to be accurate. I think that's reasonable. If God's talking, not man, man can get stuff wrong, but I think he'll get his facts straight. So if they include just outright factual errors, no, not differing opinions than popular culture, but factually false statements. Like, for example, in the book of 1 Maccabees, it is a modest portion of book history. You can find out about the origins of Hanukkah through it. But in one instance, it accidentally refers to Nebuchadnezzar as the king of Assyria. Nebuchadnezzar was the king of Babylon, and so for that reason, among others, we, or the authors, don't recognize it as divine scripture. It was never intended to be. Man can make mistakes, but God won't. So if we're expecting God to get his facts straight, and we're not talking about copyist errors, we're talking about inspiration, we'd expect them to be able to know the difference between fact and fiction. Second, they need to be consistent. If you give me all the right information, great, you are in line with most math books. But if you are talking about the same God, that's also important. Because you can say truth in the name of a false God, and it's still based on a lie, right? So that also needs to be held into consideration as the same God that has spoken throughout history, going all the way from Moses to him being revealed in the flesh in the person of Jesus. We have a consistency in their character. Third, you needed to be accountable for the information that you shared. If someone were to come up and say that this is from God, not from me, and they find something wrong with it and say, you have lied in the name of God, which is a capital offense, by the way, they could dodge the issue and go, oh, I heard it it from them. Then Buck passes to them and they go, oh, I didn't hear it. He's lying. And look. If God's going to speak, he's going to do so directly. He's not going to make this bizarre playground exchange or some bizarre web of conspiracies that narrow back to the original person who may or may not have said this. God's not going to play that kind of game. So you'd either be directly accountable for it, this is on my neck, or it's not going to come out of my throat. Simple point. 
Then lastly, and most importantly, if God's going to speak words, he will back them up with deeds. You look throughout scripture, every single time that God is performing miracles to the nation, it is not for the sake of showing off. It is to confirm reasons for them to trust his words. God's not going to expect you to trust him without reason. That's why they call it faith. The word faith means trust with reason, not without reason. It's oftentimes misused as its own sort of noun and topic and saying, oh, well, if you just have faith, if the faith is happening, put the words in. If I trust God with reasons, okay, what reasons? What faith? Is it good or misplaced? Are those good reasons to trust God or bad? And every single time that God gave a witness of his word throughout history, going right down to the book of James itself, James's ministry was confirmed by verifiable and public miracles. It's also part of the reason why it's not that we haven't ceased seeing miracles today. Some people don't have access to scripture, and so when they see missionaries come into their town, for instance, sometimes God will allow them to be given the same confirmation that these books were given in their day. But the reason why I don't have to perform miracles to confirm this to you is because we can narrow down in the history behind these books, which we still have access to, thank God, are available for us to know and to come to fair conclusions about. So it's ultimately on us not to know the tests, but to apply them. And when we're talking about these things, you can test something and test something and test something, but the purpose of a test is to get a grade, to come to a conclusion. And James passed that test 100%. That's why we're listening to what he had to say. Didn't matter who he was related to. Didn't matter how much time he spent with Jesus. It's because he was telling the truth and he lined up with everyone else who also was sharing the same truth, that they were speaking from God. Now, once again... I spent a good deal of time talking about why we should listen to what James has to say, but let's move from the theological into the doctrinal. Why else should we listen to what James had to say? Well, apart from his reputation as a biological half-brother to Jesus himself, since Joseph wasn't Jesus' biological father, and also noting that James was the leader, the first leader of the early church, not Peter, He was the first hostile witness to Christianity who wouldn't have believed it unless it was true. Now, what do I mean by that? Well, understand, as Jesus' younger brother, let me say that again slowly, as Jesus' younger brother, if your big brother started telling people after 30 years of living a fairly noteworthy life of integrity, you know, being the oldest in the home, there's always that sibling rivalry that's being made. You know, Mary comes home from a hard day at the market, as Brad Stein quoted, who broke my new clay vessel? James? Oh yeah, mom always has to be James. Couldn't be Jesus. No, he's perfect. One time he did break something, he healed it before you got home. But you you get the idea. There would be that classic rivalry between siblings that is prevalent in every single family. If your older brother had then suddenly come out after 30 years and started telling people he is God in human form, what would it take to convince you? I'd say a resurrection from the dead would be a start. And understand that until that kind of proof was given to little brother James, he thought that his brother was insane. He rejected his brother's message. He did not believe his brother was the Messiah, even after seeing miracles. The only thing that convinced him was the same thing that convinced every single one of the original apostles, that Christianity is in fact true. Because Jesus of Nazareth didn't just teach good things but made the kind of statements that only God could make. Well, put your money where your mouth is. How do we know that you're telling us the truth? I'm going to die. The most gruesome death ever imagined by human hands. Minds practiced by human hands. And then I'm going to rise from the dead by my own power. Not resuscitated, resurrected. Three days later. On the nose. Time me. And... In the earliest Christian creed that we have available on record, not according to me, according to both Christian and atheist scholars, 
1 Corinthians chapter 15, 3 through 7 records it for us that Jesus was not just seen, crucified, but rose from the dead, according to the scriptures. He was seen by Peter, then by James, then by all the apostles. James was not a disciple of Jesus, but he became an apostle. Understand the difference between those two terms. A disciple means a follower. And while the little brother scenario of following your big brother around is generally the stereotype, would have been kind of hard when he walked on water, you know. Anyway, just Michael Jr. joke. Look him up. He's hilarious. But when we're talking about these things, James passed the test of an apostle, one who was sent out by Jesus on the same ground that any other prophet in the Old Testament was held to. And it's for these reasons we want to listen to what he had to say. He was the first hostile witness of Christianity, followed by Saul of Tarsus, who later became Paul. And on these two accounts alone, we can confirm that Christianity is true by any fair inquiry of historical criticism. So, with all that said, what did James have to say? Well, in a word, if we're going to summarize this whole book, humility. Now, humility, we usually think of humiliation, the act of being humbled. And that generally is an unpleasant experience for most people, where they're knocked down a few notches. So then people would take that and run with it so far, they end up hanging themselves with it by saying, okay, so if I'm a humble person, that means I'm depreciative, right? I'm always talking about how I'm terrible, I'm miserable, I'm the worst well, understand, an arrogant person, someone who's got too much pride, as opposed to, you know, the opposite stat of this, as people usually understand it, we're talking about the same issue. You're focused on yourself. Whether it's in a positive or negative sense, catch this, it's just as proud, prideful, to focus on yourself negatively as it is to focus on yourself positively. In a sense, humility in a few words would be not thinking of yourself. But if I were to narrow it down to the shortest number of words possible, do you know what humility is? Honesty. Honesty. It's referring to and viewing yourself and others in line with reality. And understand that. If I understand they're made in the image of God, and so am I, I'm not going to view myself as superior to them. If I understand that my experience and my perspective is for God's glory, not my bragging rights, I'm not going to hold my reputation above anybody else. The point is being made in this, and that's the whole book in a nutshell, humility. What that actually looks like, being honest with yourself and others and how you view them. Now, I want to make six points that essentially emphasize this, both horizontal, horizontally, referring to you and your fellow man, and vertically referring to you and God. First is, if you're human, follow God. Reputation does not matter. Rich or poor, life's hard, then you die. Just don't look at me all hateful and religious. This is James talking. Rich people won't stay that way forever. In the end, they'll have no one to trust but God. Poor people don't have riches to delude themselves. In the end, they have no one to trust in the end but God. So who do you think has the better perspective? That doesn't mean that the rich are inferior to the poor, and vice versa. But what we're talking about is the perspective. If you have riches, great, but don't let that be something that you're deceived by, because riches give you that kind of temptation to say, you know what, I think I have more to offer this world than that person. And while in a material sense that may be true, James points out in this book that that poor person may have more spiritual insight to offer someone than you could ever offer physically. And what's going to last forever? Now, no, doesn't mean that rich people are evil. Doesn't mean poor people are good. But it's referring to that principle. Wealth is irrelevant. If you have more to offer or less, make sure that what you have to offer is God. Because as Proverbs notes, and James quotes often, riches have a way of making themselves wings and flying away, all Napoleon Dynamite style. So, you can have that in your mind. Now you can blame me for a lost night of sleep. Anyway, he then goes on to emphasize God isn't the cause of evil. He's the source of everything perfect and good. 
He isn't the problem, he's the solution. Don't get those two confused. How does that conjoin with riches? Well, understand as well. The reason you lose your wealth isn't because God took them from you. It's because e people either made dishonest choices that affected you, you made unwise choices that affected you and those around you, or simply put, this world has a way of just things going wrong. Don't blame God for how things end up working out. Understand things will work out because of him. Don't get the two confused. Second, if you have faith, trust with reason, right? Live like it. Talk is cheap. Rich or poor, they're both human to God and should be treated the same way, as was emphasized before. And he also even takes it a step further and not just saying, okay, you trust that Jesus is who he said he is, right? And did what he did to prove that that is the case for you. If you believe those two things, by the way, you're a Christian. But a lot of people get into that delusion of thinking, well, I believe in God, therefore I'm a Christian. Believing God exists isn't salvation. James point this out. He says demons believe that God exists and that fact horrifies them. The emphasis is how you relate to God personally, not intellectually. Third, if you want to know if you're perfect, watch your mouth. Like I said, he's honest. What comes outside shows what was inside. And here's a good example. If I bless God with my mouth, I sing the hymns, I quote the verses, so on and so on and so forth, but I curse men, and I'm not just referring to cursing them in a profane or vulgar sense, using that kind of language. We'll get to that in a second. But think about this. If I love to be sarcastic, if I love to burn someone in the comment section, if I give off that kind of attitude, and I'm not saying in a correcting sense, I'm saying just to see them humiliated. <laughs> We're just going to use that word. We're made in the image of God. I almost don't need to finish that sentence, but I will anyway. Do you realize how that cancels itself out? I bless God with my mouth, but I also curse his creation that reflects his image and likeness. The ability to make good decisions, not just with what you say, but what you do, is what's called wisdom. And that starts and ends with God. Go pure. Or go home. There is no 99% truth. There is no 99% sincere. And when we're talking about these things, it's oftentimes a lost art, especially in my generation. When we talk about things like language and the way that we talk to each other. Now, for anyone who's spent a number of years with us in this ministry, you've known that I've had the opportunities to talk to people who didn't have nice things to say to me, and in kind, I've had the unfortunate opportunity to return it. Now, I'm not saying that everything that I've said or done is right, but I am pointing this out. There is a time for correction. There is a time to draw the line with people. But when I return vulgarity for insult and degradation, calling people names, even if it's not using their same four-letter words, it's still sharing their same heart. And this goes into extension why Christians should not use those kinds of words. When we're talking about profanity, cussing, using those sort of terms for their own sake, and again, I understand younger audiences are going to be watching this as well, but I'd rather you hear it from me in a biblical setting than having your linguistic classes spoken to you by memes on the internet. When people are told not to say words like the S word or the F word or the B word or fill in the blank, you know, what is the F word talking about? Well, it's an acronym that's referring to the act of sexual intercourse. Likewise, what's the S word or the CR word? We're talking about a slang term for poop, for defecation. When we say the B word, what's the definition of that word? It's referring to a female dog. 
When we call someone an A, we're referring to them as a donkey. If I use these terms as some sort of adjective or adverb, and you run into the kind of people who just say it as if, you know, it's the only way to communicate their heart. I'm not kidding. I've met people who couldn't make it through one sentence without saying the S word just for its own sake. And I'm not condemning him. I'm making the point in this. Why do they say those things? It's not because I expect them to act like a Christian. I'm expecting them to know what words mean. When I tell someone not to use that kind of language, firstly, it's because it reflects a heart that can't think of anything except defecation, sexual intercourse, and animals that are bent on being bred. That's generally the context that the B word is used by, a dog in heat looking for a mate because she wants to get pregnant. And that would be also a term synonymous with a prostitute, some other words used to describe that. But understand this, the reason why we as Christians shouldn't use those words isn't because those words are evil. It's because those words are inappropriate. Now again, what does that mean? Well, if I were to come up here and say to you, purple acorn sky taste red, you'd have a few questions. First off, what do you mean by that? I don't think any of those words communicated what you intended them to. Why did you use those words in a sentence? I gain nothing from that. Exactly. If I keep using vulgar references, if I keep using slang terms that are popularized to communicate an emotional response just for their own sake, then it shows two things. One, I can't express my own heart without offending or appalling someone to get their attention. Or, I simply don't know what those words mean and have just come to think of them as another word you say when you feel an emotion. Neither are true. And if we as Christians are going to be positive witnesses to this world, something we all want to be, right? We want to show people what Jesus is like? I think he knew what words meant. And he also knew not to misuse words to get reactions out of people. Trust me, you can use normal words and get emotional reactions from people. Don't believe me? Go to any college campus and tell them the truth. They will not like it. But when we're talking about these things, understand... If you have a struggle with your mouth, James sympathizes. He says, if you want to be perfect, then master your tongue, because that thing is a fire that's set on by the pits of hell. We all have issues with our mouths, not just referring to bad language, but referring to just the general attitude that wants to see people brought low, another extension of pride. And that's what brings us to our fourth point. If you want peace, avoid pride. It's the root of every single sin. Now understand this. I mentioned before that humility is an honest view of yourself and others. Pride is a dishonest view of yourself and others. Wars are fought without in this world because of the war that's going on within. And when this conflict between ourselves and our desires then extends to our views of other people, and they either stand in the way of what I want, or I've convinced myself that others are lower than me, than they actually are. Look at any single endeavor of war and show me an instance where one or both sides didn't dehumanize the other in order to justify going to war and killing each other over these things. Now note, we would note World War II. What was the number one tactic of Nazi Germany? was to make sure to emphasize Jews are not human. Use the Darwinistic ideas and theories and making sure that there was that emphasis of saying you're not killing people. In fact, in the concentration camps, if any of the guards would ever be re refer to the Jews that they were torturing as humans, when they were disposing of the bodies even, if they referred to them as anything less than the German word for rags, they would be beaten. Likewise, and I'm not saying this was wrong, but it was also the tactic of the United States. They made sure to emphasize, we are the good guys, Germany are the bad guys. Nothing could be further from reality, but we're also still talking about other human beings here. 
And if I compromise on that point, it's like, oh, they're Nazis. They're less than human. You've missed the whole point. What are we fighting against, the ideology or the individual? Oh, you hate all Muslims? No, I disagree with Islam. And I know for a fact that it is not true. And it's leading these people not just to spiritual death, but others to physical as well. And I will do everything in my power to learn everything I can about it so I can informatively confront the beliefs of those that I love and want to see with me in heaven. And one of three things will happen. Either those that were going to kill me will reveal themselves and hopefully be caught. Those who have the potential of killing me will have doubts that could end up saving lives. Or those who wouldn't have cared either way will at least be aware of a better option. I don't see a lose in that scenario in studying Islam. And likewise, in the term Nazi that's thrown around in the United States today to justify and dehumanize anyone that they disagree with, making the comparison to Hitler and that whole logical fallacy. If I say that you are less than human, I'm looking at you dishonestly because that human that I disagree with is still made in the image and likeness of God. Now note, people still do evil things, and yes, there are still people that hold evil ideologies in this world. But who is going to ultimately come to conclusions about that? Me or God? My job is not to bring final judgment on them, not even to ensure justice. Both will be done by him. My job is to show them their, his heart, and if I have to, to defend my own person as well. But hopefully it won't come to that. And that'll only take place if we stick to the market of ideas and words. That's why free speech is so important in this nation, and why I am the first one to stand in its defense when it's under attack. But moving on from that point, going on to pride, wars, conflict, everything comes without because of what's going on within. We kill and fight each other because of the conflict that's going on within ourselves and our own hearts. And until this war is put to rest, the wars in this world won't end, won't end either. But speaking of which, James also emphasizes God doesn't fight wars. He ends them. And if your conflict is with him, you'll lose. He doesn't play that game. To be friends with the world is to be enemy, to have enmity with God, to be in opposition to him. We're talking about something that is literally a force fighting against the unstoppable force. Us trying to push the immovable object. I'm either going to be on good terms with God by accepting his mercy, or I'm not. And not is not a place I want to be. Fifth, if you could die tomorrow, honor God today. Life is fleeting. It is written nowhere that we will have long lives. Following God gives life meaning and a worthwhile future. But understand, God will come for us either when he comes down or we go up. Either way, we should live like that day could be today. Because who knows? It very well might be. And finishing up, if you are following Jesus, call yourself a Christian, then obey him. Don't take your time going through a fine-tooth comb and saying, oh, well, this doesn't mean what it's, what, it, what it's saying. You see, my interpretation is, you do realize there's a right and a wrong answer, right? You do realize that I emphasize to ask questions in these comments, not just for your benefit, but for mine. You know, if I say something false, I'd rather learn from it than stand on the laurels of my own non-existent infallibility. If I call Jesus Lord, and I think that statement is fairly clear. What does Lord mean? Well, it's a dictionary definition term and synonymous with master and it's referring to so many things you do what he tells you and that's james point and by extension as well if jesus is our master and he became our servant then what should we be doing meet and serve people where they are at 
There's nothing wrong with times of happiness or sorrow, but understand that when it comes to the things that are wrong with us still, and of course I'm referring to sin of any kind, deal with it. Be honest about it. Find people you can be accountable to with it. Because when it comes down to it, there is a reason why Jesus had to be so brutally killed in order to free us from it. Because it was that bad. Jesus was treated as our sins deserve. Makes you look at the cross a little differently, doesn't it? You understand this as well. Everything in this book is incredibly convicting. And that word means to make someone aware of their guilt. If you're convicted in a court of law, it means the judge has announced you guilty. If I'm going to look at myself and I'm going to say, am I humble? Do I treat people based off of reputation or the fact that they're made in the image and likeness of God? Do I put feet to my faith in every single way? Do I watch my mouth in all ways? Am I a humble person or am I proud? Do I live for God as if this could be my last day on this earth before I stand before him in eternity? Do I treat Jesus like the Lord I claim he is? No. I try. The Holy Spirit gives me the power on a daily basis to do so. But with the choices that I make in life, I'm still fallen. And so are you. And I'm not saying this to discourage you. I'm noting this because that's the whole point of the book. James isn't saying be perfect like me. He's saying be perfect like him. Because we're following him, aren't we? Shouldn't we start acting like him? We'll continue to mess up. I know that's very fatalistic, but it's also honest. And that's what we're trying to do, right? And that's why he ends the book with confession of sin. Confession means to say the same thing. If I acknowledge that I don't meet these standards, that's the first step God needs to ultimately get into this heart of mine and yours and do something about it. Because if we think that we're perfect and we're not, what can God do? If we acknowledge we're not perfect and turn to him for help, I think that's how he works. Thank you for your time and listening to this study. If you have any sincere questions about the topics we've discussed, be it about language, be it about humility, be it about anything that we've discussed, or anything that you've read in the book in your own time and would like further clarification on, please leave them in the comments. I'd be more than happy to engage with you. If you'd like to encourage the ministry, you know what to do. But most importantly, if you know someone who would be benefited by this study, who would be blessed from hearing it. Thank you. I want to, Please share it with them. I'm getting ahead of my routine closing here. You'll understand when you speak. You have to kind of go on autopilot sometimes to gather your thoughts. I apologize. But I want to thank you for your time and listening to this study. I want you to remember that Jesus loves you. And I'm not saying that just because it's a routine. It's a reality. Because if he didn't love us, if it was all merit-based, James points out we'd be toast. <laughs> but that's the good news. God has had mercy on us. We have a moment in history to look to, among others, that that is, in fact, the reality. And if we start there on the basis of his mercy, we can also meet on his terms for righteousness, or the other word, humility. <laughs>